Was it rotten? Oh. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there and being patient with us. We had a few little technical difficulties that we were trying to, to work out. We'll wait just a, a couple minutes while, or a couple seconds here while we, uh, the participants um, are able to connect uh, to the webinar. Um, this goes to show even sometimes Zoom is tired at the end of a long work week. So um, we do appreciate you taking the time to join us on this and our other webinars that we have been sharing over the past few months related to COVID-19. I hope that it's been helpful and inf informative for you. Um, as we prepare to all head back um, at different levels, different times to our um, working environments, we thought it would be important for you all to be as informed as possible. We know there's a lot of information out there, but wanted to provide you this uh, great opportunity to talk directly with one of the leading medical professionals in our community. So today we are very grateful for the time of Dr. Larry Watts. He is the Chief Medical Officer at Overland Park Regional Medical Center. Um, he's been in this position since 2018 and Dr. Watts leads the Overland Park Regional uh, Medical Center's hospital and staff and is continuing to build and improve quality patient safety, and overall culture and environment. And we all know how important that is. Uh, he has an extensive background in healthcare, which spans more than 24 years as practicing. Uh, he's board certified OBGYN physician. And in addition to, to numerous other leadership positions, uh, Dr. Watts holds a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and a medical doctorate from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and has earned a Master's in Health Services Administration from the University of Kansas Medical Center where he received the Healthcare Executive of the Future Award from the School of Health and Policy and Management. Very cool. Well, again, Dr. Watts, thank you so much for taking the time um, out of your busy day to join us. Um, and I will let you uh, kind of go over some of the information that you would like to share. And then um, if you all out there listening have questions, please put those in the chat box. And then we will um, have a little bit of dialogue and ask some of those questions uh, at the end. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, again, I'm Larry Watts, a uh, long time, basically spent most of my life here in the Kansas City area, and um, happy to basically tell you what our experience here at Overland Park has been the last eight weeks or so. Um, I think before we talk about COVID, um, I think we always should try to figure out where we have come from before we try to go forward. And so I think a lot of people that have read about the uh, pandemic currently have probably also read the comparisons about the Spanish flu. So I'm not gonna really go over that a whole lot. Um, obviously it was a bad flu that killed a lot of people in 1917, but we feel like uh, medical care has improved a whole lot since then. But just to put uh, influence in perspective, really we didn't know a whole lot about the flu, what caused the flu until the 1930s and 1940s. Um, we really didn't develop a good vaccine uh, probably until the 50s. And in uh, 57 and 68, uh, we had pandemics that hit similar to what COVID's done, where there was a million um, people affected and 100,000 deaths, 60 to 100,000 deaths here in the United States. And so there is some experience. Uh, there was also in 2009, the H1N1, which fortunately didn't contribute to a lot of mortality, but was can still considered a pandemic. So in our past, remote past, um, we've dealt with influenza pandemics before. Um, I think the difference between this one is um, prior to probably the, um, you know, the 80s and the 90s where influenza vaccines were relatively available to the whole population. This one, we don't have a vaccine to try to develop a, the herd immunity. So that's what makes this infection novel. And that's what I think has uh, most people um, most concerned about. So when we first started seeing our patients come in the middle of March, um, like most people, we had to learn from our um, mistakes. And so we were used to doing what was called a respiratory virus panel on people that showed up with um, signs and symptoms of influenza. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, that's not part of our, um, 
RBP panel. And so these patients were oftentimes negative, and then we assumed that they were negative for influenza. And then it wasn't until KDHE came out with their COVID-19 that we started figuring out that these people were, were positive. And so we had to do basically uh, trace studies on our own employees uh, because a lot of times they were taking care of patients uh, without any mask or, or gown or gloves. Um, so we learned quickly from that. And in fact, we basically quit doing RVP panels and um, started relying more on x-rays and CT scans. And then finally, when the availability of testing was more um, robust, we started relying on the COVID-19. Now, the COVID-19 test is basically a nasal pharyngeal swab. So you get a Q-tip up your nose and then down your throat. And most people who've had something, you know, touch the back of their throat know that it can cause a gag. And then having something up your nose can either make you gag or want to sneeze. And so there is some risk in collecting the test. And that's why when you see people on the news doing drive-through clinics and doing COVID tests, a lot of times they're in pappers or those um, devices that basically enshroud the whole the whole uh, head uh, because again uh, close proximity to a sneeze or a cough is where we feel like uh, you have your greatest risk of exposure the other thing that we've had to try to figure out is um, how to cohort people and initially we tried to cohort within the hospital and then ultimately we decided to try to start cohorting at the HC facilities at one facility so that people get um, um, most experience in managing um, because there's some skill involved in taking on and off a PPE appropriately um, and not contaminating yourself. Um, also, um, there's a risk of contamination of the healthcare workers as well as other patients in the hospital. So that uh, took a while to figure out as well too. And I think that again, um, time we learned very quickly. And then finally, the final iteration I think that we started doing is we limited visitation. In fact, we shut off all visitation for a while. And we started te testing the temperature and giving universal masks for essentially anybody that came into the hospital. We also asked questions about symptomatology the idea behind it is that you know we try to identify people before they get into the facility rather than afterwards um, and then have to worry about um, do they expose anybody else. So as we start getting out into um, you know how do businesses open up and things like that, I think you know it, it's probably going to be a good thing just to look to see how Overland Park did it. And I would say that probably, you know, I saw one of the questions was should we do temperatures on everybody? Well, if you don't have a touchless thermometer, it may be very hard to buy right now because everybody's out trying to buy them. And if you don't have face masks, those might be hard to purchase as well too. But if you do have either or both of those available, I do think a touchless, and what we've done is basically use the area behind the ear um, as the location to do the temperature. And um, for us, a fever is anything over 100.4. And these are digital thermometers, so you don't really have to, it's not like the old days where you had to shake and look and, and whatnot through a glass prism. This just is a readout. I think, uh, you know, testing a temp on your, on your workers and even, again, possibly, depending on the volume of your, of your um, people coming into your business, um, that might not be a bad thing. And then if you do have access to universal masking, um, I think that would be great to provide. If not, then again, I think if you have a business that people have to queue up or line up, trying to basically X off um, six feet in between to try to maintain that distance, I think is, is probably very prudent. So, um, you know, I think asking questions about symptoms, I think we do at the hospital. I don't know how businesses would feel about that. I don't know how customers would feel about that. But again, asking somebody if they feel ill before they walk in, I don't think would necessarily be a bad thing, depending on how, how the response was. So I think getting out um, is our testing. We started doing testing on, on um, lots of people. It used to be just people that had symptoms. Now we're doing it on anybody that's coming into the hospital for a surgery or an induction of labor or even a MRI where they may be given sedation or have to be put to sleep. Um, we're doing uh, 
pre-testing for COVID. And that testing is becoming more and more and more negative. Um, so I think the virus um, is uh, on the downhill climb here in Johnson County. I live in Leavenworth County and, I, and up there, of course, Lansing has um, had a lot of people ill um, and it's considered a hot spot, but even outside of the Lansing Hospital, uh, the population, I think it's, it, the incidence of COVID is going down. So I think that um, we're not seeing as much admissions for COVID. We're not seeing positive tests on asymptomatic people before their surgery. So I'm, I'm comfortable in saying, I think now compared to eight weeks ago, there's less COVID in our community. I don't think anybody can tell you that there's none, but I do feel like um, we've um, waited um, a good amount of time to allow this to die down. And I, I, I do feel confident that opening up um, can be done because we've started opening up at the hospital and, and, it, and you know, so far so good for us. That was uh, great information. I um, We've had a few questions um, generated beforehand, and I think we've got a few questions coming in, but if you're um, open to it, we'd love to kind of brain a little bit. Um, I have one, um, just as I think about reopening our chamber offices, and um, we're thinking about optional return in June. Um, so, do we need to be wearing masks all the time um, if we're just in the common area, if we're going into our, we have a small kitchen area, uh, you know, I know most businesses, offices have break rooms. If we're going into the break rooms, we need to wear a mask. Is that what you would recommend at any time? Well, or? I, I think again, if you can respect social distance and you're not, you don't have a cough um, or, you know, or you don't have allergies where you're sneezing a lot, I really think the mask is for the protection of the other person, tell you the truth, not yourself. Um, because again, the, the virus itself is small. And so most level three masks, the pores are too, too big to prevent the virus from coming in. But when you, an aerosolizing um, procedure, like um, for us, that's like when we intubate or we do CPR on patients, that's our highest risk of exposure in the hospital. An aerosol, aerosolizing, procedure outside the hospital would be like a, a deep cough or a sneeze. That would be the highest risk as far as potentially exposing others. And so, again, I think the mask would, would be in close proximity if you can't maintain the six feet or if you're, you know, having um, coughing or sneezing. Okay. okay. Um, so another question that we had was regarding the masks and the PPE. Is there an effective way of cleaning these? I know some of the uh, some of those materials are hard to get. Um, and just as a, uh, we will be um, sending out some links to PPE um, later today for those of you listening. But um, can any of these be reused or cleaned in any way? Well, you know, I think that the, uh, the cloth mask, I think are, for, for the typical lay person, I think is probably fine. Because again, what we're just trying to do is um, confine, you know, the, the splatter from a sneeze or a cough. And I would just say washing it in, you know, hot water with soap would be fine for that. So, because you're really, again, I don't think the mask that you're seeing is protecting you from anything coming out. You're just really trying to confine the sneeze and cough from inside going out. So you're really just cleaning it with secretions from yourself. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on a second wave of COVID-19 in the fall? I mean, do you think that that's in likely? In the fall? Yes. No. Well, again, I think, um, right now, there's about um, 120 drugs, and I believe there's 170 vaccines and over 1,700 clinical trials going on. Most of these are being fast-tracked, and some will prove to be fruitful. So, I mean, again, unlike the debate about doxycycline and hydroxychloroquine and, and those things, I think there are other drugs, some that have been around a long time and some that are being newly developed. And I do believe that we're gonna have better treatment for mild and um, moderate and even severe um, infections. So as far as will it, um, will it 
happen. I think if we get better treatment, people might present faster. If we can, and our testing will be quicker and better. And if we can isolate and quarantine those people versus quarantining everybody because we don't know who has it, I think we'll less likely have another pandemic. Um, and then finally, if we are able to get a vaccine, um, again, I think that'll be pushed out really fast, unlike um, the flu vaccine where um, you know, that you have to go to the pharmacy and things like that. When I got vaccines as a child, they would actually come to my elementary school and give us shots and whatnot. So I think there will be a big mobilization. I can't say whether it will be the fall or the winter, but I do believe probably, um, you know, it started in March. I would think by the next six to 12 months, we'll have something out there that at least some of the population, whether it's 65 and older or you know, under the age of eight and 65 and older, will be pushing out to try to prevent the pandemic. So better treatment, better ways of testing and diagnosing it, and then hopefully some uh, facsimile of a vaccine. Uh, I don't think we're, we're gonna hopefully be faced with a pandemic, although we will be living with COVID still. That's great, that's great to hear. I actually uh, uh, listened to the Trump administration's uh, press conference from the Rose Garden today, and they were uh, talking about that they uh, have a lot of confidence that they will have a vaccine out and mobilized for the entire country by the end of the year. So I know that seems pretty aggressive, but um, it was, you know, interesting and encouraging to hear that they think that that could be possible. So I believe that was uh, Secretary Azar and uh, President Trump that we're talking sure. about today. Sure. So, um, and uh, I think you touched on this, but, um, you know, sort of outside of our regular cleaning and sanitizing, are there other things that we need to be considering, like looking into our air handling systems or other uh, just processes within the health of the building itself that maybe we as uh, property owners, building owners need to be considering for our uh, tenants? Well, yeah, I think if your air handler does have the capability or already has a half a filter, I think that would be good. Um, you know, I think that, again, um, this virus, I, the people go back and forth as far as how infectious it really is, whether it's large droplet or small droplet. If it's large droplet, it probably is not going to travel very far versus small droplet does tend to travel. But even the travel is usually a result of me, let's say, sneezing onto a, a surface and then someone else coming by and touching where I sneeze and then touching the door handle and then somebody else touching the door handle and then maybe touching their face. So again, I think that the social spacing and um, in public and um, possibly the cloth mask and then ultimately just washing your hands. The only thing I'd also say about masks that I kind of worry about is that anything that makes you touch your face more gives you the increased risk of infection. So if you're not used to wearing a mask, suddenly wearing one for long periods of time, you'll find yourself adjusting it and touching it. And again, if your hands aren't clean, then every time you get close to your face, your nose, your eyes, you potentially have the risk of, of giving you know, yourself the, the virus. So, so I think you have to be somewhat cautious with the mask, but if you're going to be, if I had a talk with my internal medicine residents today and I told them if they're going to do two things, wash their hands frequently, um, and then, you know, try to try to keep space um, from other people that you know, you're not commonly in contact with, like family or whatnot. Um, can we, uh, next question, I'm sorry, is um, can we start to gain herd immunity without a vaccine? We hear about yes. that a lot. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what they're doing in Sweden, that's what they're kind of counting on is herd immunity. So herd immunity basically means you've got the infection and then as a result, you have um, um, antibodies to it. And so you don't typically get it again, although there's some debate about this, but really it's a, it's a coronavirus. It's just a novel coronavirus and other coronaviruses you typically don't get but, but one time. But that being said, um, yes, if you can get roughly 50, 60, 70, 80% of the population to have had the infection, then the virus has to jump from one host to another. And the more people that have, have antibodies that the virus can't jump to, the less likely it is to be able to jump and then the virus basically dies. So if it can't get to another host, especially if it kills the host, then it dies with the host. 
or if it can't get to another host and the host amounts an immune response and kills the virus, it can't go on. So the virus is only as good as it can jump to the next host that's at risk. And um, so that's why in Sweden, they basically isolated the people that are old because um, they're at greatest risk of dying from the virus and they allowed the young people that are at great potential of getting over the virus to go ahead and get exposed and allow the herd immunity to occur normally, which is kind of what happened when I was a kid. I had mumps, I had chicken pox because we didn't have vaccines for those. And so whenever I, when I came from a large family, when one of the kids got chicken pox, my mother had us all get it just to get it over with so that she wasn't dealing with chicken pox for two or three or four years, so. I remember that too. Yeah. Um, just a, a quick, clarif quick clarification. There's a question out here um, asking about the, the fever, you said 100.4, right? That's sort of that, that number that you're looking at. Okay, yeah, so um, 100.4 is what is considered to be a temperature that is- Yeah, I think the, the CDC initially came in, I think they used 100.2. I mean, traditionally in the hospital, that's what we've used for fever is 100.4. You know, I don't think it really matters a whole lot. I think most of us have temperatures. Where if we take our temperatures frequently, it's gonna probably be, 96.8 to 99.9. So really, I think anything over 100, if you really want to be, um, you know, I guess, uh, I, you know, I, I think if I had a temperature of 100.1 when I normally run 97, I'd be a little concerned about that. But, but what we use for our cutoff is 100.4. Okay, great, great. Um, Next question is the national newscasts um, have recently referenced Kansas City as the hot spot to watch. Uh, does that cause any alarms to slow down the phased reopening that is in place? I mean, if you, what are your thoughts on that? Not really, because I mean, again, I think that uh, they're saying it's uh, something to watch. And I would say that um, it's probably maybe based on the number of positives per capita. Um, Going back to kind of what we just talked about, about the Swedes, you know, if a, a whole bunch of us, because for a long time in the beginning of this um, pandemic, we were only testing people that were positive for symptoms or fever. We weren't testing people if they didn't have symptoms. And what we know now is that there was probably more people that were asymptomatically getting over the virus than actually had the virus. So if we were, let's say, a hot spot before, then going back to that herd immunity, there's probably more of us now that have had the exposure and gotten over it. So again, hopefully that we're closer to a herd immunity than say, if we went out to Western Kansas where they only had two people from the county that had it. Um, you know, if you go to church out there and one person has it, it could, it could really cause a problem out there because there's very few people that have been exposed. Okay, okay. Um, so what health practices do you expect or recommend becoming part of our long-term office policies? Um, you know, will we be forever, you know, stocking up on gloves and masks and taking temperatures? Or do you think that, um, are there things that we just as employers need to be continually and, and for the long-term thinking about to protect our employees and their families? Well, probably the biggest thing I think that needs to change, and that's what we needed to change here at the hospital, is this kind of um, um, macho idea that you go to the hospital or you go to work when you're not feeling well. And I think that's something we really need to work away from. I mean, you know, even asking somebody who's sick to go to the doctor and get a note, in my mind, kind of implies you want proof that they were sick so that they weren't, you know, just like trying to weasel out of going to work that day. I think we've got to, as employers, have to make it okay for our people if they're sick to stay home. Because again, um, even here, like I said, at the hospital, the expectation kind of is if you have a runny nose and it's not a high fever, you, you, know, you would go to work. Um, um, but I think that's got to go away. I think that all of us basically need to trust our workforce, unless they've been shown to be untrustworthy, but trust our workforce if they're feeling ill that they do stay home until they're at least 48 hours without symptoms. And that's really 48 hours without taking anything. So if I have a fever and I'm taking an aspirin or a Tylenol and I lower my temperature, that's not really being a fever. So I would say you shouldn't, if your main symptom was fever, you should be 48 hours without fever without having to take Tylenol or something like an antipyretic to do that. And, and that I think is probably the big change that I would say with employers. 
I think that's a really excellent point. I think that um, often times we all have this idea that, you know, the, the world or the office can't survive without us. And, um, you know, I think that one of the most, um, you know, illuminating things about all this process is how truly one adaptable we all are. And, and for the most part, many of us uh, can work from home. I know not all of us have that opportunity, but, um, that there's enough technology out there that even if somebody is maybe just a runny nose or very slight fever, um, they can still, you know, do whatever they need to do and do it from home or just that, you know, old fashioned rest. Yep. Chicken, it'll or something. And again, oh. at the hospital, we do it already. But again, I think as employers, you should try to encourage whether it's, I don't know, um, if a department, if everybody gets their flu shot, they, they get to wear jeans or something like that. But I mean, I really think we need to encourage just getting the regular flu shot because prior to COVID, we still had 65,000 people die from influenza this, this year. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we look at large populations, probably only about a half the people that can get the flu vaccine choose to get the flu vaccine. And so Again, I think that number will probably be higher next year because of COVID, but uh, like everything, we get complacent as time goes by. But I think we face a flu season every winter and people die from the flu every winter. Um, and I think encouraging our employees to get the flu vaccine would be another thing. I think employers could help with everything. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we have a question about the ER of Shawnee, um, located here on Shawnee Mission Parkway. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, um, I know that, uh, Health Midwest, uh, or excuse me, HCA, uh, that was a blast from the past, uh, consolidate a lot of their operations um, to the main campus. Do you know when you'll reopen the ER? It'll have, do not, it's really kind of based on the volume. And so we're doing our best to keep, unlike a lot of hospitals um, in the country and even in the area, we've not had any layoffs. Um, so we're trying to re, um, um, adjust and trying to keep our people employed where we have the volume. Um, and when we see an, uh, an uptick um, in the ED visits, because that was really hit by COVID a lot. And I think people were kind of afraid to come to the ED unless they had something that they thought was COVID related. And so the volume really has dropped off in, in the EDs. So, it's, but as that picks up, like with everything else in the hospital, then um, we want to reopen everything that we had before. I am hearing some messaging out there, though, and I think there was some concern that, um, you know, if you are having symptoms of stroke or, you know, heart attack or whatever that might be, that to definitely still get yourself to the emergency room or the proper medical attention, correct? And, 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 and unfortunately, though, we have seen people wait longer. So like for stroke, every minute counts, and really for heart attack, every minute counts. What we have seen through this COVID, which is, I think, human nature, is people wait longer to see if it really is bad before they come in, rather than maybe earlier, but before COVID, when they had, you know, a sign of a, a face droop or a chest pain or something like that. So we're seeing people show up, but they're showing up later in the process, and sometimes with um, poor outcomes as a result. Yeah, that, that's that's scary. Um, so. Do we know how long asymptomatic patients are contagious? We think the number is 14 days. Um, again, most, with most flu, with most influenza, there's a period of time that uh, the virus, once it gets inside the host, has to replicate in order until it causes symptoms. So it's there, it just um, hasn't caused symptoms. And there are some people that will never get symptoms just because their immune system fights it, but they could still have it in their, um, you know, their sneeze or their cough when they do that. So 14 days is roughly the time that we've been working with um, during this pandemic. Okay. Um, what about, uh, you know, we heard a lot and there's been so much information that cycled through and it seems like one week everybody's talking about something and then we're on to the next thing, but there was a lot of discussion about when we bring our um, items in from the grocery store or our Amazon deliveries or whatever, do you, do you still encourage everybody to be wiping everything down before they put those away? Or what is your uh, recommended practice on bringing items into the home? Well, again, I think that um, as we start to open up, I think we should start to open up. So I, I think that if what I would probably do in my household is if I 
got an Amazon delivery, I'd probably open it up like I always do, but then I would just plan on washing my hands afterwards, especially, you know, um, if I was going to, I mean, I would just wash my hands afterwards because again, human nature is we touch our faces so frequently and we don't even know about it that, um, you know, I, I just think it's always good just to wash your hands frequently anytime you come into contact with an inanimate object that you don't know who else touched. So that would be, you know, the outside of your door handle when you get into your car and um, the door that you open up in the way into work. Um, you know, I just think it's good once you get settled before you start doing your routine, wash your hands. So. Um, I think most of our questions have been answered. I, I have another one. Um, you know, I have uh, young children, not that young anymore, but you know, they're, it's a uh, warmer weather. They want to get outside, play with each other. I mean, what are your recommendations to us as parents and how do we, um, you know, keep our kids healthy? Do you think it's okay for our kids to start playing with each other? I've let my son go on a couple just socially distanced mm -hmm. bike rides around the sure. neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that it's probably okay in my mind to do like play dates. So if you have people that you know and you trust that if their kids were ill, they wouldn't bring them to, around your kids. I think that's probably a good start. I don't know if you should just go to the public park right now and you know let them, you know, do do their thing. I'm hopeful that we can get to that point some some someday soon. But yeah, I think getting outside, sunlight we know in, improves our vitamin D levels and. Um, People that are in nursing homes have low vitamin D levels, and they've actually been shown if you have a low vitamin D level at your risk of um, serious um, sequelae or, or dying from COVID is even higher. So I think fresh air and sunshine is always good. And I think if you can have your kids outside around other people that or other children that you feel confident are, are healthy when they're around, then I think that would be okay. What are, you, what are your thoughts about school opening up in the fall? Do you think that's gonna happen for our kids? Yeah, my son's a school teacher, so we're talking about this. I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think for, um, you know, what we may see is that like the um, high school kids start first, and then maybe middle school, and then maybe elementary school, because obviously, the more um, closer you are to being a young adult, the, the greater your immune system. While a five-year-old is still developing their immune system. So it may be a phased approach where we let the older kids start before the younger. But um, I think that uh, it's not going to be easy to um, educate children remotely at a large scale basis right now. So at some point, I think we gotta be able to get back to educating our kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, are there any other questions out there? I think we've gotten through most of them. Um, this has been really helpful for me personally, just as an employer, and I hope helpful for everybody listening. We will, we've recorded this, we will be sharing this with all of our members, and um, we have a, a Reopen Shawnee campaign that we're um, getting out with all of our business, so we'll be sharing that. and. Um, you know, really appreciate your time today. I know you're very busy. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time and answering our questions and providing some really valuable insight to all of us. So thank you so much. All right. um, well, good luck to you all. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. So we will send out an email this afternoon with the um, recorded webinar for everybody along with some uh, of the new CDC recommendations, um, new phase 1.5 uh, reopen guidelines uh, released by Governor Kelly, and then also some information on where you can access PPE for your uh, employees. So um, again, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend um, and get out, at least get a little fresh air. I don't think it's going to rain the entire weekend. Um, thank you so much for your time, for being our uh, supporter of the Shawnee Chamber and um, look forward to connecting with you next week. We have a webinar coming up, our EDC, which we're opening up to all of our members uh, this month.
for with uh, Secretary Toland, and then um, as I was sitting here, was contacted by Senator Moran's office, and they also will be hosting a webinar at some point with our uh, Shawnee Chamber members. So be on the lookout for that information, and if there is anything that we can do to help your business, please contact one of our staff members. We are here to assist. With that, be well and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep, uh, registration for all of our webinars can be found on our homepage of the Shawnee Chamber website.